What happened to the Jeffrey Kessler interview on SiriusXM? We learn more about the new charter agreement, what owners had to say about the lawsuit going forward, plus Greg Biffle's a hero. Welcome back to Break Hard, I'm Matt. Yeah, we're not gonna talk about this lawsuit forever, probably just today and if any new information comes out after this, but a lot did happen on Wednesday into Thursday. And one of the biggest talking points on Thursday stems around SiriusXM NASCAR, Dave Moody, and their interview with Jeffrey Kessler, the, law, the antitrust lawyer that is representing 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports. Kessler called into Dave Moody's show on Wednesday and did an 18 minute interview with him. And I'll be honest, I thought it wasn't that bad of an interview. I thought that, Moody did a good job of representing and asking questions. I thought Kessler did a good job of answering those questions as thoroughly as he could. And for the most part, I thought that it was not bad for all things considered. People accuse SiriusXM NASCAR of being state-run media all the time. There's certainly no China Central Television or uh, you know even RT, maybe even NFL Network if you want to really get down to it. But they did a pretty good job. Well, if you wanted to listen to that, you can't now because it's been scrubbed from the internet. It got cut from the replay. You can't find it on the SiriusXM app. It's been it's not on the internet for you to find on social anywhere. So what happened to it? Thankfully, Matt Weaver from SportsNot uploaded it to his Twitter X account, and you can go listen to all 18 minutes there. So I went back and listened to it again today. Once again, I was like, yeah, that's not a bad interview. Yeah, credit to Kessler. He essentially walked into the lion's den, right? He's walking in and talking to people that certainly don't have the same outlook on this case as he does. For Moody's point, I'm not a big Dave Moody guy, but the questions he was asking were fine. He definitely tried to steer Kessler in a couple directions, um, maybe tried to give him uh, with a gotcha moment once or twice, but you know, you do it out of like a good faith type of thing. Do you agree with what the other side's saying? No, neither side ever seems to do that, but you know, you're at least giving equal representation. And I thought that it was good that XM did that. But what happened to it at the end of the day? Now you have people like walking around Tom Hanks and Castaway yelling for Wilson. Now we're out here yelling, where's where's the interview at? Why can't we listen to it? What happened to it? Now, did it get scrubbed? Did somebody, you know, in the ivory towers of Charlotte or Daytona Beach call down to Sirius XM NASCAR and they're like, you gotta cut this out. We can't give this guy a platform. I, I'm not putting my tinfoil hat on and going to that length. Uh, I don't think Jim France threw, you know, a fit and was like, you got to get rid of this because it really wasn't that bad. Honestly, what I think possibly happened here, and I don't agree with it, but I think what maybe happened here is that it was cut from the replay because of something that Kessler said. So on the topic of Kessler being like, you know, teams were pushed around in this and kind of forced to sign this charter agreement, Moody pushes back and he's like, I don't think guys like Roger Penske or Rick Hendrick are going to get pushed around. To which Kessler responds with an analogy to domestic abuse and essentially the beaten wife type of thing where like you're beaten enough, you're you convince yourself that everything's fine. And you're like, no, you know, everything's fine. This is what it's going to be. I can understand they cut it because of that. Advertisers are fickle. As a person that comes kind of from, well, not kind of, definitely from a marketing and advertising world, I get it if you don't want your brand associated with something like that. And they cut it for that. I understand it. Do I agree with it? No, because SiriusXM NASCAR, you're paying for that subscription. Um, something uncensored, something like that. It come, It's par for the course. Uh, you should expect something like that. Uh, on the other hand, I, I get it. You got to keep, you know, sponsors happy. You maybe don't want to delve into that uh, type of thing. I understand it. Don't agree with it. Understand it. So maybe that's what it was. Maybe there's nothing heinous going on here. Maybe there's nothing that's like, uh, you know, nothing sinister happening. Maybe it's just because of that. And if that's what it is, that's a reasonable explanation. And I can understand that. It'd be good if somebody would give us an explanation about it. Because at the after all, Dave Moody yesterday told all the Twitter lawyers to sit back and just take a listen which we would, except we can't because it's gone, other than the fact that Matt Weaver uploaded it. So if you wanna to listen to all 18 minutes of it, you can do it there. We also got an article from The Athletic on Thursday from team owners talking about this lawsuit. And of course, they're talking under the condition of anonymity because they don't want retribution from NASCAR, which I understand, don't agree with it, understand it. I did not have the balls to do what 2311 Racing and FRM are doing because I was afraid I'd lose my charters. Now, I completely understand that. That is the equity that some team owners had. Some team owners aren't you know, as independently wealthy as what some owners are. Some owners aren't Rick Hendrick or uh, Gene Haas or Roger Penske. They don't have bees next to their net worth. I get it. 
I understand you have to sign it because you need the equity that comes along with those charters. I mean, if you have two charters, we're talking about somewhere between 60 and $80 million. That's certainly not a number to scoff at. I understand that. Another owner said, I don't know how this ends up, but I don't see either MJ and Curtis Polk, Jordan's business partner, or Jim France giving an inch. That's not what either does. Going to be fascinating to see what happens here. That was from a NASCAR team executive. Yeah, going back to the last dance, Michael Jordan, he looked at this and he took that shit personally. And that's why we're in the position we're in now. He thinks that there is, he and his business partner, Curtis Polk, think that there is a different um, you know, avenue that NASCAR should be going down. And that's why we're here. But Michael Jordan, super competitive. Curtis Polk, super competitive. Jim France, super competitive. He is his father's son. Neither of these guys are moving. Any of these guys, neither would insinuate two. Any of these guys would insinuate more than two uh, are moving. They are buried knee deep, thigh deep in the sand. You are not moving them until something, I don't know, cataclysmic happens, um, seismic happens, and some changes are made. One owner said this could potentially be very good or very bad for the sport. And honestly, that's kind of where I think a lot of us are sitting at right now. I don't have a dog in this fight. I understand NASCAR side of thing. I understand the team side of thing. I'm just here trying to represent and explain to fans what's going on. At the end of the day, the fans are the ones that lose out here because instead of talking about on-track action, we're talking about what's happening potentially in a courtroom probably 18 months uh, from now if it goes to trial. I still don't think it does. Um, but yeah, it could be good. And it could also be really bad. So we'll have to sit back and think about it. Uh, one says, quote, if 2311 wins, we're all going to get a better deal. And if 2311 loses, we're not going to bail anything, nor is NASCAR pissed off at us for going against them. Either way, we don't lose. I think that's probably the general sentiment amongst most teams. They can sit back and be like, hey, if you guys win, good for all of us then. Rising tide lifts all ships. We're going to benefit from this. If 2311 racing loses, burns out like the Hindenburg, then they get to sit back and be like, we've always been with you guys. We've been pro NASCAR from the beginning. Get rid of those guys. They came in here. They're trying to disrupt the way we do everything. They're not disruptors. They're we work. Get them out of here. We don't want to deal with this anymore. We've always been with you, Jim France. They can all do that, right? Like uh, anybody that's in North Korea <laughs> or something like that. Uh, they can always just hitch their wagon back to NASCAR and be like, we've always been with you guys. We believed in you from the beginning. Those two years we negotiated, that's just negotiating stuff. Like when you go in to get a car, everybody has to do that. It's the, it's the game. It's the act. It's, yeah, Ugh, not sure. But uh, that, I think that's probably a general sentiment amongst most teams. And then one team owner said, I've been waiting on this. This is going to be wild. This is going to be wild. If this goes to discovery, if this goes to a jury trial, yeah, sit back, grab your popcorn, um, kick back and enjoy the show because we're about to learn a lot of things that we didn't know. Um, and we're going to learn where the money is going. We did learn some things, though, on Wednesday because of this lawsuit that um, was filed. Uh, one thing we learned, teams don't own their cars or the parts. They are essentially leasing all of this. Uh, to the point where like NASCAR even has it where they can't use a next gen car in a non NASCAR sanctioned race. I didn't know that. Uh, Jeff Gluck and Jordan Bianchi didn't know that. Doesn't seem like anybody outside of the teams necessarily knew that. And that's huge because they're spending a lot of money on this to essentially not own something. They're leasing it. Is there a mileage limit that they can go to? Do they have to pay for going to that mileage limit? Somebody get the bow tie guy from TikTok that sells Mercedes Benz to come explain it to everybody because. Yeah, that's a curious one, and one I can completely understand why the teams are upset. So essentially, that's what one of the teams, the team's argument, of course, is the monopoly, where NASCAR controls the racetrack, NASCAR controls the broadcasting revenue and the negotiation that goes into that. NASCAR also owns the cars and negotiates the prices for said cars and the parts. Teams don't have a say in that, and you have to purchase all of it from the same source. That's going to be their argument, of course, when it comes down to the monopoly. I'm curious to see how that's going to change. And that could possibly be something that definitely has to change uh, going forward. And if it goes to a trial, Jeffrey Kessler is going to be sitting back here and he's got he's he's cocked, locked, ready to rock up with a lot of these things um, that he's going to be talking about. We. Um, we also learned racing's expensive, which we already knew, but in the lawsuit, uh, 2311 Racing says they spend about $3 million a year in cars and parts, plus it takes $18 million a year to run the team minus the driver's salary. We kind of knew it was between 18 and $20 million. Getting an official number, though, um, is interesting, and the amount that they're spending on parts is, you know, 
uh, definitely something that we maybe didn't have a full grasp on, a full number on. Um, part of the new charter agreement. NASCAR is capable or basically seized the team's IP from this. And that was a major sticking point for 2011 racing. And it should be right. Like that's what college athletics just went through was the whole NIL deal where it's like, uh, if you're profiting off of this, people should be getting paid. At least the people that, you know, IP you're using here. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised some teams signed up for, for that one. If it's laid out how it's kind of explained in, uh, the lawsuit. In the charter agreement uh, that was signed by 13 of 15 teams, teams don't have a say over rule changes and they don't have a seat at the table for the governance of the sport. Two things that they wanted did not get. Yeah, they want to say over rule changes because it costs them money anytime that happens. And they want to say over the governance of the sport and kind of the direction because, well, it affects all of them. Think about like the NFL owners meeting or MLB owners meeting, whatever. Um, they all get to say over the direction, rule changes, everything that goes into that. Teams wanted that, did not get it. Uh, NASCAR is aiming to undermine the relationship between drivers and teams, according to this lawsuit as well. Essentially, NASCAR would have more control over the drivers. Don't love that. Not really sure the extent of it, so I'm not going to comment on it too much. Like, obviously, yes, NASCAR should have the ability to suspend drivers, but what type of control they have beyond that, eh, not 100% sure on. Uh, but it was noted by Jeff Gluck from The Athletic and the new charter agreement uh, by teams signing up for that, that released them from the ability to sue NASCAR and antitrust claims, which if NASCAR is concerned about antitrust claims, having a clause in there is certainly something Jeffrey Kessler is going to put in his back pocket so that when they get a the trial, he can pull it out and slap it on the table and be like, why is this in here? Except he's not going to do that because he's not that animated uh, as I am. So we learned a lot of new things. Um, curious to see how all of that plays out going forward. One last thing, though, real quick, Greg Biffle, absolute hero. Give him a uh, Congressional Medal of Honor, Medal of Freedom. I don't know what the civilian medal is, the highest ranking one that you can give to him. But what this guy has been doing for Western Carolina, flying his helicopter in and out day after day after day since Saturday, making hundreds of trips at this point, delivering supplies, rescuing people. Um, I mean, on Wednesday, he posted a photo of and a video of a family that was using a mirror to get his attention on, you know, a hillside. And he went down there and talked to them and they just wanted, you know, for him to let the, their family know that they're safe. And he gave them supplies and everything that goes along with it. Greg Biffle has put this on his back and he has risen well above what the average person would do. And I think it's super commendable. Um, I saw Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s wife post uh, Biffle's Venmo account. Uh, I'm not... I, can't post it here because the QR code is going to get flagged um, immediately. But you can go to her social channels and it's on there. Maybe it's on Biffles. I'm not sure if it's there or not. If you want to donate to his cause, because he's doing all of this out of his own pocket. And um, super commendable because what's happened there is absolutely uh, devastating. And I'm glad that he's been able to make those trips. Um, I'm glad so many people have stepped up. Obviously, people in the sport have Hendrick Motorsports, Joe Gibbs Racing. Uh, tons of teams have donated supplies you know, donated their haulers to drive, you know, loads of supplies up there and donations. The Hendrick helicopter was making rounds uh, again on Wednesday into Thursday. Uh, Cleus McFarland flew up and or maybe was down from K Kentucky or up from Florida, wherever he was at to run a bunch of trips on on Saturday and Sunday to help these people out. The the devastation is just absolutely wild. So. Yeah, um, Greg Biffle, heck of a race car driver, better person uh, when it comes down to it because it takes a lot and flying a helicopter is not easy. Flying a helicopter into a mountainous area like that with tight tight quarters, a lot of trees around, a lot of power lines, stuff down all over the place. Um, he's, he's doing really good work up there and I think it's super cool to see and hopefully he gets the recognition uh, when this is all said and done uh, because, yeah, I... When it comes down to it, like flying that many times and helping out as many people as he has without an obligation to do it is certainly uh, commendable. So let me know in the comments what you think about where the Kessler interviews at, what the team owners said, some of the things that we learned from the charter agreement, Larry Mack, or uh, even... Greg Viffle, what he's doing. Let me know in the comments. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog. 